from the latest on Caribbean cruises to kosher safaris, pilgrimages to Jewish Eastern Europe and award-winning wines and international cuisine in sun-drenched Tel Aviv. Sit back and enjoy the trip with the travel edition of the Jerusalem Post podcast. Let's play a game. Are oh, you going to say hello to me? Hello to me. No, hello to me. To okay, me too. Right, yeah, uh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Mark. David. Hello. Hello, how's it going? <laughs> Let's play a game. <laughs> Let's take two countries, anywhere around the world, but they've got to be countries that like you wouldn't put together. So, for example... Israel and Iran. Exactly. Perfect. But we don't do politics on here. So what, what other types of two countries could go together to make a podcast that would be, oh, those don't really go together? Suriname mm-hmm. and Vietnam. Okay. Apart from the fact they end in Nam, so there's probably a link. There. I'll go with Vanuatu and mm, Bahrain. Central African Republic <laughs> and Fiji. Oh my God, this could go on all day. Shall we right. stop this? I'll do another one. What about Hong Kong and Jamaica? That's a really good one. That will never work together. No, absolutely not. So why don't we make that today's podcast? Really? Yep, yep, yep. We're going to be heading off to, well, we're not, we're actually in the studio, but we're going to be heading off to Hong Kong and then to Jamaica. I know a joke about Jamaica. Shall I tell it? Oh, no. Okay. No, no, no. But those are two really, I guess, from our perspective as Brits living in Israel, those are both really exotic destinations, aren't they? Yes. My wife went on holiday. Are you still going to tell your joke? Jamaica. No, she went of her own accord. Okay. Oh, my Lord. Let's get on with the podcast. Ah, oh, Question number one. Mark, why don't you go for it? Question number one. In English, what does the name Hong Kong mean? And question number two. What was the name of the first capital of Jamaica? The answers at the end of the pod. Israel is the startup nation, the scale up nation, the unicorn country. Join me, Mayan Hoffman, Jerusalem Post Deputy CEO, Strategy and Innovation. And me, Zachy Hennessy, the J Post Business and Tech and Innovation Correspondent, for our analysis of the most critical Israeli tech innovations today. In each episode of Inside Israeli Innovation, we'll highlight a new tech trend, discuss the latest innovation news, and interview at least one of Israel's most promising companies. So if you'd like to know what's on the cutting edge, then this Jerusalem Post show is for you. Listen to Inside Israeli Innovation on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. So a couple of times of late, having not done Asia, as it were, we featured countries in Asia, but on both occasions, I think you said that you've been to, now I've got to remember this, Singapore and Thailand? Yes. And I've been to Japan. So we've got a lot of work to do. I mean, of course, we live in Asia, in Israel, and we've been to Uzbekistan, and we've been to countries in the Arab world, but in terms of East Asia, we're still lacking, eh? Does being in the airport in the country count? No, we've had this every single week. Why, which country are you talking about? Hong Kong. Oh, you were there? I was. My plane arrived, and, and you know me, I'm very athletic, I like to run. Mm-hmm. And this very lovely lady greeted me off the plane. She said, quick, quick, your next plane is going to go. She made me run across Hong Kong Airport, which is huge. And then got me there and she went, yeah, it's going in an hour and a half, take a seat. Excellent. Was it Cathay Pacific? It was Cathay Pacific, they're lovely. What a coincidence. Why don't we hear all about Hong Kong from the Israel country manager of Cathay Pacific Airways, and her name is Cosima Watkins. with Hong Kong everybody pictures you know skyscrapers and all of that but there is actually so much more to Hong Kong than just that what people don't know it's actually 70% nature so it's got country parks woodlands mountains beaches so there is so much more to do and it does cater to all preferences yes it is a great cityscape it's great for food it's got great shopping great nightlife but then also on the other side you've got the nature part so there's great hikes cycling swimming camping if you're so inclined so it really is something for everybody um mark shaking his head (laughs) 
Well, I'm assuming you also don't like camping the way you said that, Cosima. So I did it once <laughs> over the last three years when I was there when there was not much else to do. So it was fun, but something maybe I wouldn't do again. <laughs> David and I love to have fun, especially theme parks or weird museums. We've been to a museum of toilets before. Where was that? That was in Kiev, I think. Oh, wow. (laughs) Um, And we've been to things like a museum of soap and dirt. We, We love a fun museum or a theme park. Have they got any of those in Hong Kong? So for the museum part, I know that there's a cup noodle museum which might be interesting and a bit unique. So it's got the Mm. history of cup noodles and how they came to be about. And they're quite a staple in the diet, so it's probably quite an interesting museum. Theme parks, we've got a really great theme park, actually. It's called Ocean Park. You've got the rides and attractions, but then it also has a focus on animals and conservation and education. So they've got great animal exhibits too, giant pandas. I don't know if you've ever seen a panda before. They've got dolphins they've got penguins so it's really really great and I I used to go a lot when I was growing up there in Hong Kong wonderful and then for adults as well it's just as fun they recently opened a water park side of Ocean Park so you've got really a little bit of everything and one of the most unique bits about this park actually which I think is great is it's based off two campuses and it's got mountains in the middle so you can go on a train through to get to the other side or you can take a cable car and you go over the top of the mountain um, and then you've got amazing views of neighboring bays so it's quite something special you know not many theme parks you have to take a cable car to get from a to b so it's a really really great theme park i really enjoy it i've always said I refuse to go into a casino because the sort of gambling in my family, gambling and smoking and all sorts of terrible vices we won't go into on the podcast. And Mark repeatedly on the podcast says, oh, I want to go to Vegas, want to go to Vegas. But I'm assuming you would suggest that you don't need to go to Vegas in order to have that type of experience. What happens in Macau and what is there to do there beyond casino? So, yes, On the casino side, I suppose Macau is Asia's answer to Vegas. And you've got the typical Venetian and the Parisian and the Londoner. So you've got the Eiffel Tower, Big Ben and all of that. They do shows as well. I don't know if you like shows instead. There was a really great one called House of Dancing Water, which I can only describe as Cirque du Soleil, the aquatic Cirque du Soleil. So it was really, really amazing. So they've got that. So not really casino, but something a bit more fun. And it gives sort of the Vegas feel as well if you go to a show. But there's also the historical and cultural side of of Macau as well. So it used to be a Portuguese colony and there are still some historical sites that remain. So there's the ruins of St. Paul's Cathedral, which is often the picture that you can see of Macau, people standing in front of the steps and they've got the ruins uh, behind the Macau Fortress and the museum. So you've got the historical side and you've got the fun casino side. So I suppose, David, you can go to the museum and Mark can go gambling. (laughs) You can come and bail me out afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'll tell you what, we've only met Cosima once and she's already got us pegged. She knows what our character strengths and weaknesses are. Exactly. I spent a bit of time, luckily, working in Asia. And I always remember people referring to Hong Kong as having a very decent sized Jewish community. Our listeners are obviously interested in all things Jewish. Is there plenty of communal history that people can go and see, can go and experience? And can you get kosher food in Hong Kong? Hong Kong does have a thriving Jewish population. I I believe it's now up to about 5,000, the community there. They've got a Jewish community centre. And part of that, that I know that there's a historical society. So they've got sort of archives and documents there where you can learn a little bit more about it. Active synagogues, two schools, a Jewish cemetery, The Jewish Community Centre has um, events and things like that as well. On the kosher side, so there aren't too many kosher restaurants in Hong Kong. Most of them are part of the Jewish institutions. I know that the Jewish Community Centre has two kosher restaurants and also a kosher supermarket. So there are some options there in Hong Kong. Can you get kosher cup noodles? I don't know. I'm not (laughs) sure. You'd have to go to the museum to find out. (laughs) We're talking to you because you're the big cheese from Cathay Pacific in Israel. Hang on a minute. If you were a big cheese, Cosima, what type of big cheese would you be? <laughs> so you asked my favourite cheese. <laughs> I guess, yeah, yeah, really. Um, I love a brie. <laughs> Solid answer. A runny answer, depending on the type yeah. of thing you like. <laughs> so you're responsible for Cathay Pacific in Israel. How easy is it to access Hong Kong from Israel, from Europe, from North America? 
And has anything changed now that you can fly over Saudi Arabia and over Oman? Cathay Pacific flies between Hong Kong and Tel Aviv three times a week. We're flying on Sundays, Tuesdays and Thursdays. Since the opening of the Saudi airspace, we've been able to reduce the flight time by around 30 to 90 minutes, depending on the season. From Europe as well, we've got direct flights from eight different cities. We've got London, Manchester, Madrid, Milan, Zurich, Frankfurt, Amsterdam. From the Americas, uh, we're flying direct six different cities at the moment. So JFK, LAX, San Francisco, Boston, and then in Canada, Toronto and Vancouver. And then we're actually relaunching our Chicago service from October. So you've got plenty of options, direct flights from Israel, Europe and the Americas too. Once you make it to Hong Kong, is there another destination near Hong Kong that you would recommend? So if you use Hong Kong as a hub with Cafe, where would you go next? Once you're in Hong Kong, you've got access to our entire network. You've got access to 15 cities in China. I know Japan is incredibly popular. So we actually fly to six destinations in Japan. So you can do more than just Tokyo. We've got Nagoya, Osaka, Fukuoka, Sapporo. So it gives you a little bit more options. And then Thailand, again, very popular, flying to Bangkok and Phuket. Australia, uh, New Zealand, Singapore, Korea, you know, you've really got a great pick of the bunch. Once you're in Hong Kong, you've re- you really got access to anywhere. What about the onboard experience? Cathay has a really good name. It's not Mark and I that are saying that this is repeatedly Cathay being awarded around the world by the, the top award givers. But what is it? What's the je ne sais quoi? Speaking of awards, I have to mention that uh, recently we were delighted to receive the award for best in-flight entertainment from Skytrax. So that really is one of our key things on our on our in-flight experience. So and we're really proud that the customers have recognised our efforts in bringing the best uh, in-flight entertainment. We're adding new titles every month. So there's always something to watch, a whole collection of HBO Max Originals, A24, which is sort of an indie art house studio. Um, So no matter how long the flight is, you'll always find something to watch, caters to all tastes and preferences. And we can guarantee that you'll never be bored on our flights. How do people find out more? Is it going to the website? Yes. So yeah, definitely on our website. And we've even got a section um, called inspiration as well. So you can find out a little bit more about all the different destinations. And we've got guides on where to eat, what to do with kids, best rooftop bars. So specifically in Hong Kong, there's quite a few of them. They're all very popular. We've got an article titled How to Spend 48 Hours in Hong Kong. So that can give you inspiration. It breaks down the day, morning, afternoon, evening to give you some options if you're a first time goer or a returner. So there's a lot of inspiration there that you can find on our website. And the website address is cathepacific.com. Cosimo Watkins from Cathay Pacific, thank you very much for being on the podcast. Thank you very much, it was an honor. Cathay Pacific, Hong Kong fact file. Cathay Pacific flies directly between Tel Aviv and Hong Kong three times a week on Sundays, Tuesdays and Thursdays. There are direct flights from London, Manchester, Paris, Madrid, Milan, Frankfurt, Amsterdam and Zurich in Europe. There are also direct flights from New York's JFK, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Boston, Vancouver and Toronto in the Americas. The easiest method to get from the airport to the city is via the Airport Express, which takes 24 minutes from the airport to central Hong Kong Island. Other options include taxis and buses. Hong Kong has a great public transport system. The easiest way to get around the city is via the MTR, the underground, or for a more scenic option, you can take the 110-year-old tram on Hong Kong Island to get a view of the city as you go. An octopus travel card can be topped up at all MTR stations and 7-Elevens around the city. Taxis are also relatively cheap and are an easy and convenient option. One US dollar will buy you 7.83 Hong Kong dollars as of July 2023. Hong Kong has a subtropical climate. Summers are hot and humid and the winters are usually cool and dry. The best times to visit Hong Kong are March to May and September to November when the weather is usually cool and sunny. 
The main language spoken in Hong Kong is Cantonese, but most people speak English, so it's easy for tourists to navigate the city, and all the signs are in both languages. Hong Kong boasts one of the world's most diverse and dynamic food scenes, from fine dining to cheap eats. Popular local dishes include dim sum, barbecued meats and wonton noodles. Sweet treats include egg waffles, pineapple buns and Hong Kong style milk tea. There are several kosher dining options. Good starting points are the JCC and Chabad. You're listening to the Jerusalem Post podcast, Travel Edition. Find us on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter at MarkDavidPod or mail us at MarkDavidPod at gmail.com. And now it's time for the latest news from the Jerusalem Post podcast, Travel Edition. Every week there are announcements of new air routes to and from Israel's Ben Gurion airport. Among the latest, Iceland Air is launching flights from Reykjavik, Arkea is introducing flights to Goa, and El Al's latest destinations are Mumbai and New Delhi after recent announcements of flights to Fort Lauderdale and London Stansted. Israel's incoming tourism numbers for the first half of 2023 remain stubbornly below pre-COVID levels. 2.1 million foreign visitors entered Israel between January and June 2023, compared to a record 2.4 million visitors in 2019, a drop of 13%. Compare this with citizens travelling out of Israel. In the month of June alone, nearly a million Israelis made trips abroad. The Croatian resort Dubrovnik has unveiled plans to ban the use of wheeled luggage. Noise pollution made by the sound of suitcases being dragged along the paved streets is waking up residents during the night. A fine of approximately 285 US dollars will be issued for breaching the ban. There is growing concern in Israel about the current trend of extremists spitting on Christian pilgrims visiting Jerusalem. The head of the Israel Incoming Tour Operators Association, Yossi Fatal, met Jerusalem Mayor Moshe Leon regarding the effect on future tourism and the wider negative publicity for Israel. And Israel's beaches should be almost jellyfish free this summer. Jerusalem Post reporter Ma'ayan Jaffe Hoffman spoke to marine ecology experts who've seen few signs of the approaching menace. They believe a combination of changes in current and global warming have favoured the Holy Land's sandy shores this year. We've done Hong Kong, David. Mm-hmm. What was the diametric opposite of Hong Kong that we were going to do? We decided Jamaica is as opposite to Hong Kong as it's possible to get, which is ridiculous, and we're just making that up. But it is presumably very different. But it is an island. It is. I also found a link, but then I completely got it wrong because I thought Hong Kong has the Hong Kong Sevens rugby, so it's a very sporting nation, and Jamaica loves its cricket. And why did you get that wrong? Because one's cricket and one's rugby, so they're not really... Hong Kong hosts the tournament, but it's not necessarily a rugby-playing nation. So I guess there is actually something in common, since you've mentioned sports that were pretty much invented by the English, in that both of these countries were part of the British Empire for a long, long time. Ah, good point. Mm, So they do have something in common. save our gracious (laughs) king. King, well done. Oh, well done. What we wanted to do with Jamaica, as we've done with other places in the Caribbean, was to try to find something maybe a little bit Jewishy. And Mark found a fascinating synagogue. It's called the United Congregation of Israelites. And we spoke to President Terry Joe Hall and Congregant Mikkel Hilton. And Terry Joe told us all about the congregation. is really small right now there's only about a hundred members 
and it's amalgamated communities from the Ashkenazi and the Sephardic. In olden times, going into the last century, we had maybe 2,000 families who were Jewish and several different congregations and different synagogues. And as the attrition happened, people migrated for whatever reason, they decided to um, come together as one a hundred years ago. What can you tell us about those early days of the community? The first official record would be after Cromwell forces captured Jamaica in 1665. There is argument that Jews were here before, during the Columbus era, but historically we've always been um, children of the Inquisition. Uh, so predominantly Spanish Portuguese, not necessarily Sephardic per se, but Spanish Portuguese, which is a different sort of Sephardic. And so we, from stripes and, uh, and shades, in the sense of we were merchants, we were pen keepers, we were artisans, and we also one of the first communities in the world to gain Jewish emancipation in 1833. When Jamaica was under um, British rule from 1655, they, they took it over from the, the Spanish in 1655. Jews were kind of second class. We couldn't own land. We could own slaves, but we couldn't own land and we could not vote. So it wasn't until emancipation of the slaves in 1833 that we also got the vote and were able to own land. We spoke a while ago to a representative of the Willemstadt Synagogue, Mick of Israel, Emmanuel in Curacao, and he talked about the pride that he had in his synagogue having a sandy floor. His is not the only one, is it? No, no. there are about five in the world. Ours is really beautiful. We have the most beautiful synagogue. I wish you'd come and see it. And we have sand on the floor. The sand is really marl. It's marl dust because sand itself is hard to maintain. And it has particular significance for us. We like to subscribe to the theory that it muffled the steps of the Moranos during the time of the Inquisition. So they could worship in secret and not be found out. Yes. Okay, so that's why we have sand. And it reminds us every time we come in there. However, <laughs> <laughs> well, there are other explanations of why sand um, is on the floor. Um, as I said, there are five communities in the world that would have this. So one, it's to remind us of God's promise to Abraham about making his descendants as many as the stars in the sky and as many as the sand on the seashore. In addition to, as Terry said, but also the sojourning in the wilderness after the exodus. As well as there's a more practical reason, because in one of the synagogues, or one of the communities that have the sand is Namsadam. And the theory is that the sand helps to trap the wetness and the dirt from messing up the Taba and the and the Hechal, or the Ark and the Bima. I'm very lucky. I've actually prayed from the Bima in the one in Amsterdam. Many years ago, it was Tisha B'Av, I think. Can visitors come to the synagogue for services? What type of services are they? And can visitors come and tour the building? It is an old building. It's over 120 years old. It was all imported from like Scotland. The, the architect was a local Jew. It's a beautiful building that takes into account the winds from the sea. So it's naturally quite cool and it's it's really beautiful. You can definitely come and tour if you're visiting. You'd call ahead so that we know you're coming. You can come and tour. There's usually somebody here who can take you around. Now, because the community used to be so much bigger than it is now, we've had to close many of the cemeteries. And in closing those cemeteries, we brought those tombstones over and they're in the property of the synagogue. So you can see them, they're really old. Some of them say 1765 and they're in Portuguese, Hebrew and English. They're really beautiful. And there's one epitaph in particular, one tomb tombstone in particular that is, one would argue, anachronistic. It's unusual for its time because it has a Magen David and it's from the 17th century there, but with Kabbalistic art on it as well within the Magenda bit. So I think there's another community perhaps in Charleston, Savannah, that has one of these anachronistic epitaphs as well. We have service at 5.30 on Shabbat on Friday evenings and 10 o'clock on Saturday. We don't really have places that we recommend for you to stay that are within walking distance. And we all drive to the synagogue. So, you know, we are a very progressive community. We do have orthodox elements. There are people here who are orthodox, but they don't walk to the synagogue. Beyond the Jewish community, if somebody's thinking about visiting Jamaica, give us 
top two, top three, top four things that you think they'd like to do or you would like them to do? If they're coming for sand and, you know, a holiday. If they're coming for sand, they just lie in the synagogue. <laughs> <laughs> you go to the, the North Pole. So you can either fly into Montego Bay or Kingston. And Montego Bay really is a tourist destination. It's easy to access the, the beaches, the waterfalls, all the, the zip lines and stuff like that. However, if you want the heartbeat of the country, if you're interested in music and the vibe, you come to Kingston first. So you fly into Kingston and you, you fly in a little peninsula that juts out into the sea. And right next to it is Port Royal. Port Royal is this old area that, you know, the pirates used to be in. And it was sunk in the earthquake in 1692. It sunk the only synagogue that was there. There was a synagogue in that Port Royal Peninsula. And the tsunami spit up the Megila and certain yes. artifacts from the from synagogue, which are in a museum in Port Royal. So you can go there and visit the museum. You can see the armament stored, you know, on its side and the, the old ghosts. ports and yes. stuff like that. So that's a really great place to go. And it's a vibrant fishing community. And it's a great place to stay and eat roast fish or fried fish and bami. Bami is one of our um, Taino, the indigenous people who were here before the Europeans came. That is the food that they eat. It's cassava and, and you eat it with fish. It's, it's a great experience to have. So that's the first thing to do in Kingston. And then we have a very old colonial building called Devon House that has the best ice cream in the world, right? It's yeah. the best in the world. It was written in the tr in Condé Nast Traveller. As long as you don't call it gelato and you call it ice cream, <laughs> I'm very happy. <laughs> that old building actually was owned by a black Jew, you know, in the last century. There's so much music in Kingston and there are places that you can go like the Dub Club, which has meetings on Sunday evenings where you can go and you know, meet a lot of local people just coming there for the music. It's authentic music. And of course, in Kingston is Trenchtown, where Bob Marley sang about. And it's easy to go there. It's safe. I go there all the time to visit patients. And it's, I, I really have to tell you that even though Jamaica has a bad reputation, it's safe. And from Kingston, you can go over the mountains to Port Antonio. Port Antonio is where Errol Flynn used to talk about. And there are beaches and waterfalls and the Blue Lagoon and Maroons, right? Yes. So Maroons, wow. yeah, there's still a Maroon community yes, up there. Yes, there are actually yeah. um, there are communities. And interestingly, related to our community, we were also stigmatized during the colonial period because it was said that we assisted the Maroons in the rebellion providing gunpowder and, and other like. So there's also several um, locations that you could stay within Port Antonio, Portland in general, which actually owned and operated by members by of the Jewish community. families. Yes. yes. The third place, which is completely different, is on the south coast of Jamaica, which is not very developed. It's like old Jamaica. It's called Treasure Beach um, in St. Elizabeth, and it has black sand, and it's a really bucolic, quiet place to go, relax, and just feel what old Jamaica used to be like. So when David and I were at university, the Jewish accommodation was in quite a Caribbean-friendly area of Manchester, and, and the food there, there was curried goat and saltfish and ackee. What's the food like in Jamaica? Yeah, this is why he failed all his exams at this college. Is, this because is why I look was... like I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you didn't have the swimming to go along with it, right? Okay, so yeah, curry goat and ackee and saltfish are still staples along with breadfruit and jerk chicken is like the street food. Festival and bami. Um, there are many other little things. So like, stamp and go. Yes, fried which, planting. Yeah, which we usually have doing Hanukkah too. Right, so Hanukkah, instead of having lakes, we have fritters, saltfish fritters. Yes. Right? Mm. <laughs> for Orthodox travellers, if they're looking for kosher food, is there a source of kosher food in Jamaica? Okay, so there's a chapter of Chabad in Montego Bay. So, you know, if they contact Chabad, they can have a fully kosher villa experience you can like stay in a villa and have the beach and everything but have a chef who is kosher mm. how very nice but we're not here to talk about chabad we're here to talk about you so how can listeners find out more about your community so we have a website jewsofjamaica.com but if you're looking for a historical perspective i would recommend stan Mervis's book and my jewish learning also has a couple of 
articles about Jamaica. I'm going to say thank you to both you, Mikel, and Terry for coming on the podcast. It's been fascinating. Jamaica is one of the places that you learn a lot about growing up in a multicultural community in London. David and I have been fascinated to find out more about it. I'm going to say no more. I'm going to hand over to Mikel and let him sing us out. Jamaica Fact File There are a few hubs that have direct flights to Jamaica, such as New York, Miami and Fort Lauderdale. There are non-stop flights from London and charter flights to Montego Bay from Brussels and other European destinations. You have to change at least once from Tel Aviv. There are two airports, Kingston the capital and Montego Bay in the west that's usually for tourist holidays. There are taxis, rental cars, buses and Uber. It's easy to get where you want to go and there are tourist assistants to help you if you haven't pre-booked. Jamaica is an expensive destination due to a premium on energy costs that makes everything costly. Many shops and restaurants will take US dollars in the tourist areas but not always in Kingston. It's good to have change to give tips. 150 Jamaican dollars is equivalent to one US dollar as of June 2023. Recommended hotels include for Kingston, the Spanish Court Hotel, for Port Antonio, the Goblin Hill Hotel, and in Montego Bay, there are a myriad of hotels of varying quality. Families will like the Hilton Rose Hall with a lazy river and child-friendly spaces with an all-inclusive offering. There is a Chabad in Montego Bay and they offer kosher food. Recommended restaurants include Eats, spelt E-I-T-S, in the mountains overlooking Kingston, on the scenic route to Port Antonio. Cynthia's on Winifred Beach in Port Antonio. Gloria's in Port Royal Kingston. Jerk chicken is the ubiquitous street food. Patties, which is beef encrusted by flaky pastry, is available widely in dedicated shops or from heated cases. This is Mark Gordon from the Jerusalem Post podcast travel edition. Find us on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter at MarkDavidPod or mail us at MarkDavidPod at gmail.com. Talk about diverse. That was fascinating. I loved both and so different. And now, as we always say, I want to go to both of these as well. More than once. We grew up in a place that so many people think is exciting. I mean, you more than me in London, and people want to come and see it and visit and spend time there. And to a large extent, we take for granted the gorgeous place that we've grown up in, or now that we're in Israel, that so many people want to come and see. And yet, I think everybody lives somewhere that is fascinating and worth visiting. If I ever get the opportunity to go to Hong Kong again, I'm going to go out of the airport. (laughs) I might leave my luggage behind, but I'm going. We need to say our thank yous. And first of all, to Cosima and all of the team at Cathay Pacific and to Terry, Joe and Mikel in Jamaica. You really made this show a treat. If you enjoyed this podcast, remember to give us a good review and a five-star rating. And you can subscribe and get this podcast every two weeks on Spreaker, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or any good podcast provider. At Mark David Pod is your social media, and emails please to markdavidpod at gmail.com. And we're now on threads. Not that we know what threads is. Do you know what threads is? I don't know, but unless they're paying us, we're not doing a promotion for it. Threads is Meta's version of Twitter. So if you're a threads person, we're there too. Folks, it's time for the questions or the answers. Question number one. In English, what does the name Hong Kong mean? And the answer is fragrant harbour. So I Hong, I'm fragrant. Well, how do you know which word means which? 
Oh, good point. I harbour. <laughs> <laughs> you harbour fragrances, yes. And question number two. What was the name of the first capital of Jamaica? And the answer, I actually haven't even read this because Mark wrote this and I've just seen it now for the first time. The answer apparently is Sevilla La Nueva or New Seville, which was the first permanent European settlement in Jamaica, the first capital of Jamaica and the third capital established by Spain in the Americas. Not a lot of people know that. That was a very good answer, David. Well written, Mark. Thank you. Or thank Google. Should we go on our travels somewhere? Where would you like to go, sir? Anywhere. Just take me to the airport. We'll pick one. Okay, we're off, folks. Bye-bye. Cheerio.